So uh, we've been in the middle of our uh, Go Deep sermon series. I, I just want to, I'm really excited because yesterday was such a great day. Y'all saw all those videos, all those people serving. If you didn't get to participate, we're going to try to do some more of these coming up as a Kenner campus throughout the year. We've been talking about that. We built some great partnerships and did some great ministry. And uh, we want to, that's a part of our fall spiritual growth emphasis because we know that serving other people is a great way to get outside of yourselves and to grow spiritually. And I want to thank all of you who participated. I know many of you couldn't make it because of work or events or whatever, but I want to thank you guys who did come and I want to thank y'all who wanted to come. So it's, it's been great. Now this Go Deep series we've been a part of, we've been talking about being emotionally healthy and growing in your spiritual walk with God by digging deep within yourselves and figuring out areas that you need to grow in. Our first week, we talked about going deep. Last week, we talked about understanding our identity. And today, we're actually going to talk about digging up the past. Okay? So I know this might be a hard subject for some of you. We're going to have a great prayer time at the end of our service. And we really want to focus our message today on the subject of forgiveness. Let's say that word forgiveness together on three. One, two, three. Now, when we talk about our struggles with emotional health, the reason we want to talk about this is because we know a lot of people can be biblically knowledgeable Christians, but they can be overcome by the trials, the troubles, the discouragement, the disappointments, the frustrations of life, that they can be emotionally bound up. The devil can use this to keep people in prison spiritually, emotionally, mentally, because we don't dig deep and get the emotional health that we need. Now, what we know is that every one of us sitting here today has a past that has affected us in some way, shape, or form. Now, we don't need to be defined by our past or controlled by our past or in bondage to our past, but we have to admit understand and own our past so that we can grow through it. And that's what we want to talk a little bit about today. Now, when we look in the Bible, there's very few people whose lives shaped them and impacted them in such a way like the Old Testament person, Joseph. Now, Joseph was one of 12 sons, and he grew up as a, a young man. He was the favorite of his father. His father gave him a, a very special multicolored coat to just tell him how much he loved him and cared for him. And all of his brothers were a little bit jealous of him. And one night, Joseph had a dream from the Lord. And in his dream, he saw his brothers bowing down before him. So he thought that it would be a good idea to share this dream with his brothers. His brothers didn't like that very much. And so they actually plotted together and they were going to kill him. But then they decided not to kill him. They were just going to throw him in a pit and leave him. But a couple of his brothers felt bad and so they went back and rescued him and only sold him into slavery. How kind of them, right? And so he ends up in slavery and he gets sold to a man named Potiphar and he actually rose through the ranks at Potiphar's house and gained some influence because he wasn't uh, totally racked up with bitterness. He was still putting some effort into his life. And then Potiphar's wife tries to seduce Joseph, but he puts aside her seduction. He won't fall into the temptation. And so she gets mad at him and claims that he tried to sexually assault her. So he gets thrown into prison. So now he's been sold into slavery. Now he's been thrown into prison and he lives many years wrongfully in prison. But God had given him this ability to interpret dreams and he actually is able to interpret the dreams of a man in prison. That man kind of forgets about him but later on he remembers one day when the Pharaoh has a dream and he says, hey, I know this guy that was in prison with me that can interpret dreams. So they brought Joseph up and Joseph is able to predict the dream of the Pharaoh that there will soon be famine upon the land. And so they need to stockpile their resources because even though times are plentiful now, there soon one day be a famine. And because this came true, the Pharaoh was so impressed, he actually makes Joseph almost like the prime minister or the CEO of Egypt. Joseph's not an Egyptian, but he's running Egypt, basically. He's leading that. He's a steward of Egypt. He's the manager of Egypt. He's risen to a great level of prominence. And one day, his brothers, who were stuck out in a famine, they come to Egypt looking for food, and they find themselves fulfilling that dream Joseph had, bowing down before their brother, asking for assistance. Now, you imagine this. The brothers who destroyed your life, who tried to kill you, who were going to leave you in a pit, who sold you into slavery, who got you put in a prison, the brothers who ruined your life for 20-something years are now coming to you for assistance and help. What would you do 
in a situation like this. Joseph had experienced rejection, betrayal, slavery, false accusations, false imprisonment. But in this moment, God is working all things together, fulfilling the plans and purposes he has for Joseph. And here his brothers are, bowing down and begging for help. Now, they didn't even know it was Joseph. They didn't even recognize that it was him. So much time had passed, they probably thought he was dead by this point. They just knew they were bowing down before one of the primary leaders of Egypt, looking for some assistance and begging for help. And we see what happens in Genesis 45, verses 1 through 7. It says, Joseph could stand it no longer. There were many people in the room, and so he said to his attendants, all of you get out. So here he was alone with his brothers when he finally told them who he was. Then he broke down and Joseph wept. He wept so loudly the Egyptians could hear him, and word of it quickly carried to Pharaoh's palace. I am Joseph, he said to his brothers. Is my father still alive? But his brothers were speechless. They were stunned to realize that Joseph was standing right there in front of them. Please come closer, Joseph said to them, so they came closer. And he said again, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into slavery in Egypt. But don't be upset and don't be angry with yourselves for selling me to this place. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. This famine that has ravaged the land for two years and will last five more years, and there'll be neither plowing nor harvesting. God has sent me ahead of you to keep you and your families alive and to preserve many survivors. So here's what Joseph is saying. Look, I don't want you to be upset with yourselves. This is what God ordained and wanted. I was supposed to be here. God has used this in my life. He's forgiven them. He's done all these things. And we just want to break down this passage from Joseph's life. How right in this moment, the last 20 years of his life, all of this destruction, all this difficulty is sitting right before him. And he's got a choice that he has to make. And you and I are faced with similar kind of decisions in our lives. Here's what we know. The Lord often uses the problems of our past to empower us to accomplish God's purpose and destiny that he has for us. In Romans 5, it says we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials because we know that they help to develop endurance and endurance develops strength of character and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. Here's the problem most of us face. The painful experiences we've had in our past, we allow them to push us further away from God, further away from the church, and further away from our fellowship with other believers. We allow the things we've been through in our past to become a bondage to us, to become a problem for us, to become a hindrance from us. You know, most of us are trained in life to respond to our painful experiences by running away from them. We try to avoid them. We try to get away from them. We try to avoid pain at all costs. We don't want any pain. It's the body's natural reaction we want to run away now how many of you have ever tried to run away from home when you was a kid be honest you had that thought you said I'm gonna run away I always think about running away and it brings that Norman Rockwell picture to my mind it's called the runaway I think I got it up here on the screen do I have that picture no I do not (laughs) in the Norman Rockwell picture is a little boy sitting next to a police officer and right behind him is what's called a bindle. It's a stick with a little do-rag tied around the end. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And you hold it over your shoulder. I always thought that's what a picture of a runaway looked like until I got old enough to realize, what are you keeping in that thing? (laughs) I mean, how much stuff could you possibly be having in that little rag tied together on the back of that stick? And that was the problem. I remember one time, I don't even know, my mama's sitting right over here, I don't even know if she knows this. I remember I ran away one time for like an hour. I wasn't even gone long enough for them to know. I was just at the neighbor's house. I was just visiting. That's all I was doing. And after an hour, I realized, I ain't got nowhere to go. So I'm going to go back home and deal with my problems. But you know, the reality is that's how most of us are. Most of us try to run away from the problems that we have. Some people run away physically. They get out of an environment. Now, I'm going to be honest, running away is not always a bad thing. The Bible tells us to run away from some things, like sexual temptation. It says you should run away from sexual temptation. There are some environments you've got to get out of, but here's the problem. Even if you get out of the environment, you can't escape what the pain and problems did to you emotionally. 
You can't get away from how it affected you and how it impacted you. You can't escape and you can't run away from everything in your lives. Some things you're just going to have to face and deal with. I remember my mentor, his name is Ricky Rigsby, he told me about a guy that he worked with. I'll never forget this. He said, whenever somebody would walk into the guy's office with a problem he needed to solve, he would immediately go to lunch. It didn't matter if it was 9.30 in the morning, he was taking lunch. It didn't matter if it was 2.30 and he just came from lunch, he was going to lunch again. You know why he went to lunch? Because he was hoping that while he was gone, somebody else would solve the problem. He was hoping somebody else would show up and fix what he had wrong. It's one of the reasons why I hate going on vacation. Because in order to go on vacation, you've got to work twice as hard to go and then four times as hard once you get back to catch up on all the work that didn't take place while you were gone, right? The reality is you can try to run away, you can try to escape, you can try to get away, but all of a sudden that stuff's going to pile up and eventually you're going to have to deal with it. George Barna in 2010 wrote that four out of every ten non-church-going American adults say they avoid churches because of past negative experiences in churches or with church people. And the reality is we have a bad experience with somebody, we have a bad experience in an environment or in a relationship, and we try to run away and avoid that ever again. But the reality is you can't avoid the impact it's made in your life. Avoiding dealing with our past will cause us more hurt and prevent us from accomplishing our God-given purposes. So today what we want to talk about is what will it take in order for us to overcome our past so that we can accomplish God's purpose and desire for each and every one of us. We want to look at the story of Joseph and how he did this. So if you're writing down, you fill in the blanks, here's your first fill in the blank. Using our past to accomplish our purpose requires, number one, acknowledging the pain. Acknowledging the pain. One of the things Joseph had to learn in his life is that no one can cause us pain like those who are closest to us. Can I just tell you, the people that hurt you the most are the people that are the closest to you. I've noticed this in marriages. People will say things to their spouse they would never say to their boss because they get fired. We say hurtful things. We say critical things. We say negative things. We say destructive things to the people we love and care about the most. You know, the people that love and care about us the most, they know where our buttons are and how to push them, don't they? They know how to get under our skin. They know how to say the one thing that's going to hurt us. They know how to dig deep and attack us in a way no one else can. And there are more people that have experienced more hurt and pain from their families and their parents and their spouses and their siblings and their kids than you could ever possibly imagine. The people that are the closest to us are the ones who end up hurting us the worst. In Genesis 45, 1 and 2, it says, Joseph could stand it no longer, so then he broke down and wept. And he wept so loudly, the Egyptians could hear him. I mean, he wasn't just crying, he was bawling crying. He was ugly crying, you know what I'm saying? I mean, he had to get paper towels in order to wipe his eyes and to blow his nose. That's what a real man uses when he has to blow his nose. We don't use tissue paper. We use paper towels, brawny, extra strong. You know what I mean? I mean, he was just broken down because he couldn't hide the pain anymore. Most people want to ignore the unresolved hurts in their lives, but this only leads to denial, depression, discouragement, and defeat totally in our lives. It leaves us in bondage. I remember my next door neighbor, he lived two houses over, his name was Ira, and he came to me one day and he told me this story and I thought that he was lying. He was saying he was watching TV and he found out that there was a man who could feel no pain. There was nothing in his life that he could feel his pain. And I was a teenager. I remember him telling me, I was like 12 or 13, he was telling me this. He said, man, imagine how cool it would be if you could feel no pain. I mean, you could get in a fight with somebody, and no matter how hard they hit you, you wouldn't feel it. I mean, you could fight Mike Tyson. He uppercut you right in the face. You couldn't even feel it. Imagine how cool that would be. And I remember thinking, man, that would be cool if you could feel no pain. Well, it turns out there are people like that. It's actually a condition. It's called congenital analgesia. 
It's a person who can feel no pain. There's a guy who him and his brother both have it. And I read about him. His name's Steve Pete. And Steve Pete was talking about how terrible of a condition that it is to not be able to feel any pain. He has had more injuries than anybody could possibly imagine. He's broken bones in his body 33 different times. He's talking about when he was six years old, he was on a swing set and he jumped off and he landed and he completely shattered his arm. But he didn't even know it happened. Because pain is there to tell you when to let up. Pain is there to tell you when to do something. Pain is there to tell you when you need to respond in a certain way. And what he began talking about is what people don't realize is that even though he can't feel the pain, he still experiences the discomfort. And right now in his life, he can only sleep about three hours a night because of all the discomfort his body feels, even though he doesn't feel pain like you or I. And this is what is true for you and I. In the same way emotionally, when we go through painful experiences and we act like it doesn't hurt, or we try to avoid the pain in our lives, we just end up living very uncomfortable, discontent, nothing can satisfy, satisfy us lives, and we end up, no matter what we try to get in, we don't feel the pain, we're numb to it or we're avoiding it, but the outcome of the pain we still experience. Nothing can satisfy us. Nothing can answer us. Listen to me. There is nothing wrong with acknowledging hurt and pain in our lives. Most of us grew up in an environment where we're told not to be in pain, not to be hurt, not to act like anything bothers us or to ignore it. Some kids got a spanking when they were growing up and would look at their parents and say, that didn't hurt. Some adults go through experiences and say, no matter what you did to me, that didn't hurt. We try to act like nothing affects us, like nothing bothers us, but the truth is it is hurting, but we have to acknowledge and address what the pain really is. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 4 says, there's a time, everything, there's a season, a time for every activity under heaven. There's a time to cry, and there's a time to grieve, there's a time to feel and acknowledge the pain that we have in our lives. You know, the Lord is able and he'll heal our deepest hurts the minute we release them to him. Psalm 71 says, you've allowed me to suffer much hardship, but you'll restore to life again and lift me up from the depths of the earth. You'll restore me to even greater honor and comfort me once again. Here's the problem. God can't heal it if you won't acknowledge it. Because if you won't acknowledge it, you can't surrender it. And if you won't surrender it, God can't get a hold of it. A large part of the reason why we use sedatives in order to do surgery on someone is because if you try to do surgery without it, the pain would cause them to move all around. We would say, no, don't touch it. Don't get close to it. Don't deal with it. I go through this with my kids all the time. They get an injury, a wound. you got to put peroxide on it. Do they want that? No. What are they doing? Screaming, fighting against you. I don't want that at all. The peroxide is good for them. It's healing to them. It's going to bring restoration to them, but they got to let you get a hold of it. And it works the same way with you and I and with God. we got to take the pain that we have, acknowledge it, and then surrender it so that God can begin working in it. Using our, our past to accomplish our purpose takes, number one, acknowledging our pain. Second, fill in the blank. Number two, accepting the process is also required. In verse four, Joseph told his brothers, y'all please come closer. So they came closer and he said to them, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into slavery in Egypt. Now here's what Joseph was doing. Joseph was saying, I'm addressing and accepting that I indeed went through slavery. I indeed went through bondage. I indeed went through suffering and torment, but I know that God worked in it and that it was part of God's process in order to develop me. You know, the Lord wants to use our painful experiences for our good and for His glory. Romans 8.28 says, We know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose for them. Just the other day, I was uh, talking to someone, and they were asking me, how did I start going to Celebration Church? So I was telling them part of my story and part of my life. And part of my story is that when I was 16 years old, I found out that my mom was addicted to cocaine. And that was a part of her testimony. And God saved her at a Carmen concert. And she surrendered her life to Jesus. 
And she went to her company and she told them about the things that she had been doing. And so when I began telling the person the story, this is what they said. I'm so sorry you went through that. They apologized to me for going through it. And I said, I'm not sorry at all. It was the best thing that ever happened to me in my life. Because God took what was painful and used that to draw my family to surrender our lives to Jesus. And that's the greatest thing that ever happened. And if it wasn't for the pain, I would have never experienced the joy. I wouldn't even be standing here today. I might be dead. I might be living a life just racked by sin and just corrupted and just doing all things that are not healthy and good for me. But God got a hold of me by using what was painful and me surrendering that and accepting the process. When you accept the process, you realize that what you go through is not an end in and of itself. It's going to be something that God uses to develop you and to grow you and help you become who God wants you to be. The process of discipleship, becoming more like Christ, is like exercise. It's painful at first, but it leads to great results and fruit in your life. You know, when you haven't been working out for some time and you go work out, how do you feel the next day? You feel like you never want to work out ever again in your life, right? And here's what happens. The more you work out, the less sore you feel. And then if you stop working out and you go to work out again, you get sore all over again. So the lesson it's trying to teach you is keep on the process. It works the same way in your relationship with God. When you first become a disciple, when you first start growing with God, it's kind of painful. You have to go through some things. you got to dig deep to some things. When you start digging up your past, a lot of times we're bringing up painful experiences. But when you let God work through them and heal you and disciple you and grow you, that's what brings you to a place where you find the healing that you need. We should always see past problems as God's opportunities to see the Lord at work in our lives. James 1 talks about this. When troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow, so let it grow. Because once your endurance is fully developed, you'll be perfect and complete, needing nothing. One of the lessons we have to learn is that sometimes you've got to go back in order to move forward. The author Peter Scazzaro in the book we've been reading together, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, says the blessings and sins of our families going back two or three generations profoundly impact who we are today. Discipleship requires putting off the sinful patterns of our family of origin and relearning how to do life God's way in God's family. See, when you become a Christian, you just don't get a new life in Christ. You actually get a new family. For some of you, that's a big amen, right? I mean, look around the room. Just look around for a minute. Just take, just, uh, this is your family. This is your family in Christ. You realize that? This is supposed to be a new family that loves you the way a family is supposed to love you, that supports you the way a family is supposed, supposed to support you, that encourages you the way a family is supposed to encourage you, that prays for you the way a family is supposed to pray for you, and you're supposed to be that to someone else. And God takes whatever experiences you go through, and he allows you to accept them as a part of the process, to share them with one another, to find encouragement. Look, the pastor's up here telling you he's wearing stockings. <laughs> now, you might judge me for that, right? But I don't care. Because I got plenty of people that are sitting in here when I say, hey, pray for me. Guess what they're saying? We pray for you, pastor. We're encouraging you. We pray your pantyhose stay up high. <laughs> in the name of Jesus. Then, you know? Here's the reality. I don't have any problems laying those things down because I understand that it's a part of the process. I have leg issues. I have vein issues. I have circulation issues. I'm going through treatment and healing. It's very painful. And in response, there's some things that I need to do. But you got to go through that process to get the healing that you need on the other side. Amen? And that's true for every one of us. And emotionally, it's no different. What circumstances from your past can the Lord use to accomplish His plans for your life? Number three, using our past to accomplish our purpose also requires, and this might be the most important point today, learning, absolving the perpetrator. This is forgiving the person who has offended you. Forgiving the person who has 
harmed you. Genesis 45, verse 5. Joseph said, but don't be upset. Don't be angry with yourselves for selling me into this place. In this moment, Joseph is saying, look, I don't want y'all to be mad at yourselves. I don't want you to be mad because of me. I don't want you to be upset because I've released you and forgiven you for what you have done to me. Harboring unforgiveness and bitterness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Listen to me. When someone offends you and you don't forgive them, you're the person who's in bondage, not them. You think I'm keeping them in bondage, but you're not. You're only keeping you in bondage. Forgiveness is one of the most powerful things in the Christian's life. Learning to forgive the people who have hurt you. Now, every time I talk about forgiveness, I get this question after the service. Well, if I forgive somebody, does that mean I still have to have an ongoing relationship with them? And the answer is no. Forgiveness and boundaries are two different things. Okay? If a person has physically harmed you or sexually harmed you or emotionally harmed you, you don't need to continue in a relationship with that person in order to forgive them. To forgive them means that you release them from what they did to you. You're not going to harbor it. You're not going to think about how to get back at them. You're not going to live in vengeance. You're not going to wish bad things happen to them. You're going to pray for them. You're going to ask God to intervene in them. Obviously, they need God to show up in their lives. That's part of the reason why they cause so much harm to you. But to forgive them means to literally release them. I've heard people say this to people all the time. Hey, man, I just want you to know I forgive you. And the person says, for what? I didn't even do anything to you. Now, here's what's crazy. That person who said, I forgive you, they might have been thinking about that for five, six, seven years. The other person didn't even know it happened. The person who offends is not the person in bondage. The person who is not forgiving, the person who's bitter, is the person who's in bondage. If you're going to be a Christian, you have to learn how to forgive people. Now, here's the challenge. Sometimes you have to forgive people once. Sometimes you got to forgive them every week, every day. Sometimes the forgiveness is an ongoing process. I'm going to tell you one of the lies Christians get caught up in all the time. Sometimes you think you've forgiven a person. And then a few years go by, something happens, and it triggers some things, and you realize, whew, I haven't forgiven them all the way. Sometimes you've forgiven them 10%. 25 percent, 40 percent, 55 percent. I'm going to be honest, what I've learned in my life is there are very few people that have really hurt me and offended me that I've forgiven 100 percent. Most of them, even if I've really worked on it, it's about 95 percent. There's some things that happen, and they stir up some feelings, and they stir up some thoughts, and they remind me, man, i got to work on forgiving them again. i got to forgive them some more. Sometimes you forgive them 100% and then they do something else and you got to start over. (laughs) Forgiveness is not an event. It's a lifestyle. Do you understand that? It's not something you do once. Think about it like this. Has Jesus forgiven you of all your sins? Yes, he has. Does that mean you've stopped sinning? No. No. So every time you sin again, does he forgive you more? Yeah, absolutely. Now, a person who's not good at forgiving, what does that say about you? This is what it says about you. It says you don't understand God's forgiveness for you. You don't understand how much God has forgiven you. Because when you really understand how much God has forgiven you, that's what liberates you to forgive other people in your lives. Did you deserve God's forgiveness? No. So do they have to earn your forgiveness? No. Let me explain this to you. People say this all the time. That person needs to earn my forgiveness. No one can earn your forgiveness. Ever. There'll never be a moment in time where you say, you know what, I don't want to forgive them, but they've earned it, so I have to. (laughs) That moment is never going to happen. You understand that, right? You know what will happen? What will happen is you'll say, you know what, I'm going to forgive them even though they don't deserve it. 
and that's going to free you and liberate you and allow you to move forward. Jesus said it like this in Matthew 6, 9, 11. Pray like this. Forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who have sinned against us. It's easy to forgive others when we, ref we reflect on how much God's forgiven us. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to spend a little time every day thanking God for forgiving you of your sins. The past ones, the present ones, and even the ones you haven't done yet. I want you to write down the ways you've sinned against God and how he's forgiven you. Not to remind you of your sin or to allow you to live in bondage of your sin, but to remind you of all the things God's forgiven. And after you make that list of all the ways you've sinned against God every day, you can just scratch those out as you realize God's forgiven you. And what that puts you in a mindset of is realizing how much you're forgiven, which is what allows you to then extend that forgiveness to those around you. Ephesians 4.32, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Who has caused hurt in your life that you need to forgive? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to just bow your heads and close your eyes for a minute. Be respectful of the people around you. And I want you to pray this. Dear Lord, pray that out loud with me. Dear Lord, bring to my mind and my heart the people I need to forgive. Now when we get to the end of our message, you're going to have a chance to respond. And if there's people God's putting on your heart and in your mind that you need to forgive, I want you to respond and let us pray for you because you're going to need supernatural strength to forgive those people. Amen? All right, look back at me. Last point. Using our past to accomplish God's purpose also requires affirming God's plans. Genesis 45, verse 7. God has sent me ahead of you to keep you and your families alive and to preserve many survivors. Here's what we have to realize. I don't think God causes the pain and suffering we experience. I think the sinful nature of people, this corrupt world we live in, and the attack of the devil is what causes pain and suffering. God certainly allows them, but I don't think he causes them or rejoices when they happen. But in spite of the fact that those things happen, God will use them to still bring about his plans and his purposes to fruition in your life. And when you've been a Christian and you've been surrendering things to God and you've been releasing things and God's been working in you, one of the things you'll quickly discover is that what you went through that was difficult is what's going to make you the man of God and the woman of God he intends for you to be. Joseph was promoted to second in command of all of Egypt. He was blessed with two sons. The nation of Egypt was saved because of Joseph. God's people were saved because of Joseph. Without Joseph, God's people would have died in their famine, including his brothers who had caused this turmoil. In Genesis 50, verse 20, Joseph says, You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. Listen to me. When we surrender the process, the people, the pain to God, He begins to use it at that moment to develop us and to make us who He wants us to be. Psalm 16, verse 11 says, You'll show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. When you take what you've been through and you let God bring about His plans and purposes, all of a sudden, what you went through begins to make sense. All of a sudden, what you went through begins to make sense. Every one of us, we have to decide, do we want to be bitter and miss out on what the Lord has for us? Or do we want to embrace the Lord's plan and experience the fullness of his blessings, joy, and peace in our lives? There's a man, he's a, he's a minister, he's a traveling evangelist. His name's Nick Vujicic, and he has no arms and no legs. He has one little foot that has like a thumb on it. And uh, he hasn't allowed that to stop him doing anything in his life. Uh, he's married, and he knows how to swim. He has no arms and no legs. He knows how to swim. He can climb up and down stairs. He speaks professionally for a living, travels the world, and he makes this statement. It's a very powerful statement. He says, I've never met a bitter person who was thankful, and I've never met a thankful person who was bitter. You think about that. If you can take the pain and the hurt and the offense and what you've gone through and surrender it to the Lord and allow God to develop you and become thankful for the process, 
and become thankful for the process and who God made you to be and how he used what you went through, that's what will change your life and free you to live a life of fulfillment and peace and joy. I want you to watch this video. It's a clip from, uh, was, it's, it's about the, the movie Unbroken. And it's the story of a man named Louis Zampernini. He enlisted in the Army Air Corps in 1941. He was deployed to the Pacific Ocean. He was on a mission with uh, 10 other guys to go find an aircraft and a crew that had went missing. And while they were flying over the Pacific Ocean, the plane began having mechanical difficulties, and the plane crashed 850 miles into the Pacific Ocean. Eight of the 11 men died, three of them survived, and they were just floating out in the ocean for 47 days, living off of captured rainwater and eating small raw fish that they could catch with their hands. After 47 days, they landed on the Marshall Islands, where they were immediately captured by the Japanese Navy. Can you imagine being stranded in that ocean for 47 days? You finally get to land, and then you get captured. They were tortured, beaten, went through incredible uh, tormenting and suffering. Eventually, he ended up getting sent to a POW camp in Tokyo, where he found himself at the hands of one of the worst tormentors in the Japanese army. This man ended up being in the top 40 war criminals, according to General MacArthur. He went through all this suffering. He was finally released, and so when he got home, then he was free, right? Wrong. He was in prison still. Emotional and mental prison. He became an alcoholic. He was destroying all the relationships around him. His wife got to the point where she said, you know what, I'm going to leave you. I can't be around you anymore. And just as she was about to make that decision, she went to a Billy Graham crusade. And Billy Graham began talking about how God could change people's lives if they would just surrender their pain to him. And so she gave her life to Christ. She went home that night and convinced her husband that he needed to go as well. This is a story of that testimony. Let's watch this, and then we'll follow up from there with the conclusion of our message. He went through some terrible years where he was destroying his marriage, but Louis was saved by his wife's insistence that he go to see a sermon by Billy Graham, who at that time was a very young man, not very well known, but he was speaking in Los Angeles. Louis didn't want to go, but his wife was going to leave him. And he agreed on that basis to go see him speak. And he sat in the back of the audience and he was unhappy and he was sullen. But Graham spoke of things that resonated with Louis, with his experience about how God reaches into people's lives and helps them get through things that seem unsurvivable. I think all the prisoners had basically made the same prayer Get me home alive to my family, God, and I'll seek you, I'll serve you. And you make promises while you're under a dire situation. But uh, how many of them keep their promise? I didn't. And so my life fell apart. And it was at that moment that he made this realization to, to himself that he thought God had actually helped him through this, and he owed God something, and he realized what he needed to do. So I went forward in the meeting and made my confession of faith in Christ, and I couldn't believe what happened. While I was still on my knees, my life changed in a matter of moments because I knew I was through getting drunk, and I knew that I forgave my guards, and I knew it was a miracle because I forgave the bird. <laughs> and, and that was the first night. The first night in two and a half years, I didn't have a nightmare, and I haven't had one since. And Louis realized that God can forgive him for all the rotten things he did in his life, that he ought to be able to forgive those that had done him wrong. So forgiving the guards and the bird uh, was actually salvation for him. It really turned him around in an instant. He decided he needed to test his forgiveness to see if he really had truly achieved it. And he went back to Japan to meet the guards who had, who had abused him so terribly. And he went to Sagama prison where they were all being held for war crimes. He went to every single one and looked him in the eye and told him that he forgave him for mm -hmm. the treatment that he received when he was a prisoner of war. He felt no animosity. 
he just felt compassion and they couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe it. It was, it was a wonderful experience. He knew he had truly forgiven them. I think it's incredible that he forgave them. That's a lesson that he taught my father and me. By hating somebody, I'm not hurting them. I'm only hurting myself. You can forgive anybody. Forgiveness is always possible. Here's the key I want you to get out of this. That gentleman did not forgive the people that had hurt him because he was an amazing person. He forgave them because God was amazing and had transformed his life in such a way and allowed him to realize that by receiving God's forgiveness, he could then in turn extend that forgiveness to others. I don't know where you're at today, but I would guess that there's some people in your life that you need to forgive. Maybe some you even thought, I've already forgiven, but when we prayed a little while ago, God brought them to your mind and your heart again. Sometimes we have to forgive our spouse. Sometimes we have to forgive a former employer, a former friend, a current friend. Sometimes we have to forgive our children or our brothers and sisters or someone who's hurt us or offended us or done us wrong. Sometimes they've done us wrong physically. They violated us in some way, shape, or form. Sometimes they've done us harm financially. Somebody took advantage of you in a financial way. Sometimes it's because somebody smeared our character or talked bad about us or tore us down when they shouldn't. Sometimes the person we need to forgive is ourselves. We need to forgive ourselves for the things that we've done we couldn't believe we did. Sometimes we need to forgive God. But they all start in receiving God's forgiveness for your own self. 